Hi everyone, Daljeet Peterson here from astrolab21.com. And in this video, we're gonna do something a little bit different. We're gonna take a look at the birth chart of Vladimir Putin. Uh, obviously, he has captured the attention of the world with his recent invasion of the Ukraine. Uh, and there's a lot of focus and attention being paid to him right now, his motivations, uh, he's become the focus of much of the world's news attention. Um, and I was watching a documentary last night. It was a frontline documentary called Putin's Road to War. Uh, it was essentially a biography of his life and sort of looked at his career arc and all the things that led to where he is now um, and the background that might inform why he chose to invade the Ukraine. But one of the things that I was struck by in watching the documentary was how little we know about Putin the man, right? He's so much shrouded in mystery and something that we might expect from someone who uh, started his career uh, in the KGB as a spy and was working uh, with the Stasi in East Germany. So not um, uncharacteristic that someone with that kind of background would be very secretive in nature, not revealing much about his own personal life. So. And so I thought maybe it'd be interesting to look at his chart, maybe to get some insights into um, what we might discern from his, his blueprint, if you will, about the man. Um, and when I looked at it, obviously, um, there was a very significant transit coming up uh, this week, as a matter of fact. So I thought, oh, it would be really interesting to do a chart reading on Vladimir Putin and show you sort of my process, one of the ways in which I do approach a chart um, using an evolutionary approach, which I'll demonstrate here. And then it will culminate in looking at the transit um, that is really significant coming up on April 4th, which I think may play out uh, significantly in this unfolding drama. So be cool to just sort of do a chart reading for him. I mean, uh, this is someone who I, I know nothing about, obviously, but I think it's it's interesting to use astrology as a way of um, sort of an astrobiography, which is one of the approaches that we can use um, astrology for and appropriate for someone we don't know so much about. Maybe we could get some insights. So, you know, one of the things I want to talk about, and I'll share my screen here, um, and I'm calling this Vladimir Putin's date with destiny because it feels very much like that. Like this transit coming up is the culmination of perhaps an entire career. Um, and it has to do with the Mars-Saturn conjunction that's going to be happening next week. And I've been talking about this a lot. Um, I talked about it in my um, Pisces 2022 forecast, right? When we were looking at the first, and as I said, this entire year, as I said in the 2022 um, forecast for the entire year, Mars is going to make conjunctions to all the outer planets in sequence over the course of uh, 2022 starting with its conjunction with Pluto, which happened, uh, came into effect uh, on February 24th, was exact on March 2nd. Uh, and of course, as I said then, this is, this is a constellation of aggressive power grabs, right? Mars and Pluto together often are a very um, bellicose type of configuration. And I said, if you know if war is going to happen, it's probably gonna happen under this configuration. And indeed it did. Um, Putin invaded uh, on February 24th, which was Mars came in within five degrees um, of Pluto, exactly conjunct with Venus on that day. So uh, it was interesting to watch that unfold. And now I think one of the things we can do with astrology is now look back and see, okay, now that we know what took place, can we chart that, that pro progression of that energy? So that's one of the things I wanna do. And I'm just gonna review um, what we had and what we talked about, if you remember when I, I brought this slide up, when we looked at Mars-Pluto conjunction, right? And you know, I always like to look at sort of the, the light and the shadow of all these archetypes, you know, because they can constellate things that are very powerful and productive and proactive, right? We can get this intense willpower, um, courage and resolve, right? It's, it's a bit like this power of Mars and Pluto combined could be used um, 
uh, to very powerful and productive effects. But the negative side is always, the shadow side is always possible, right? And so I said, you know, brute force, ruthlessness, predatory aggression, pushing too hard. And, you know, when we look at what occurred with the invasion of Ukraine, you know, certainly this shadow side of this Mars-Pluto conjunction seemed to be in effect. So what that tells us is now we can look at uh, this upcoming um, transit. Now we're going to move into Mars-Saturn, which is going to be, we're already in it, we're in effect, and it's going to be exact on April 4th. And what we can anticipate is perhaps more of the same of this negative or shadow side of this configuration, right? Fear-driven action, frustrated energies, inflaming old problems, boundary collisions, vindictive rage, right? And all of the talk right now, we're hearing a lot about, you know, is this war going to expand to the greater Europe? You know, we're pushing borders with Poland and with all the NATO um, countries. Um, Putin does seem to be backed into a corner. We're hearing that a lot in our Western media. Um, and that he may react. Uh, he's very unpredictable. We're hearing the word unhinged quite a bit. Uh, of course, we have to take all of that with a grain of salt realizing the, the media environment we are in, you know, if we're consuming American or Western media, um, it certainly has its own bias and understanding that, but it does feel like this um, Saturn-Mars conjunction does figure very prominently. And as I said, this is exact opposite to um, Putin's natal Pluto, which to me says this is a date with destiny. And we'll unpack what that means when we look at the chart. I did just want to bring up this graph because I think some of these things may be prominent, right? It's confronting challenges. And I think on the positive side, uh, all of us are going to be in this energy field for the next couple of weeks. Um, and which side of the, the dynamic we choose to uh, engage with uh, is our own free will choice. Um, but this is a very interesting configuration in terms of um, Putin's chart. So let's take a look at that. And I'm going to share with you sort of my process and how I approach a birth chart, or one of the ways I like to approach it. I have two approaches. I call it the inside out and the outside in. Uh, inside out is where you start with the sun, the moon, and the rising, and their rulers, and you kind of unpack the chart from sort of the, the sun outward. The outside in approach is what I call the evolutionary approach, which is starting with Pluto and the nodes and working our way into the chart from there because essentially Pluto is the symbol of the evolutionary journey of the soul. So this is like a soul level perspective and I often will do this with my clients who are <clears throat> a little more uh, advanced and more spiritually inclined because they tend to really relate with the, the soul, the blueprint of the soul. And that's something that I resonate with as well. So here we have Vladimir Putin, and I'm using the um, 9.30 a.m. birth time. Of course, uh, there is some dispute about whether that is valid or not. There's another one for, I think, 11 a.m. or 1 p.m., uh, which, of course, changes the rising sign and the house alignments. Um, but this one, I think, uh, when I looked at them, uh, this gives us a Scorpio rising for Vladimir Putin. Uh, and when I look at Putin, I feel like he definitely does have that scorpionic look to him. And we often look to the rising sign as being indication of the personality uh, and the appearance, right? Uh, and this guy just has those sort of intense scorpionic eyes. Um, the other uh, dates would have given him a, a sag rising, which would have given, I think, a much different personality. So um, the Scorpio rising time does feel right to me. So that's why I went with it. Um, I'm using a whole house system. Uh, which is my preferred way of doing charts. Um, so what I want to do is start with Pluto because this is the symbol of the soul's evolutionary journey, right? This is the, the sort of archetypal theme that this soul has been working on for several lifetimes. Um, and so that's why we start with Pluto. The unconscious desires of the soul are symbolized by Pluto's house and sign placement. So with Putin, we have a, a Pluto in Leo in the 10th house. Uh, this is the ultimate sign of the ruler, 
right? Leo is all about authority, about the king of the jungle, the apex predator, Leo the lion. It's the top of the pyramid. It's a very ambitious, authoritative leadership. It's the natural leader of the zodiac. They have that fiery passion to lead, to get to the top, um, combined with the fact that it's in the 10th house. This is the house of the ruler, the house of the leader, the house of the career, of the, um, the fame and reputation. It's a very public, prominent place. So to have Pluto in Leo in the 10th house tells us that this, uh, this is a soul who has been dealing with issues of leadership, authority, and positions of power in society for many lifetimes. This is not a new experience for him. So not unsurprising that he has found his way to being a very powerful leader on the world stage, that this is something his soul is deeply connected to. Um, so that's the first thing we want to look at, and it becomes the most pivotal point in the chart. We start to look at the function of Pluto, and we connect it to the nodal axis. The south and the north nodes of the moon combined with Pluto will tell us really everything about the direction of this soul's evolution in this lifetime. And so we always want to bring in first the south node because what that's going to tell us is more about the past life and lives with which this soul has been working through this Pluto-Leo 10th house complex. And very interesting, we see that with Vladimir Putin, he has a near conjunction, almost within three degrees of exact, uh, of his Pluto in his south node, which is a doubling down of this very intense signature, right? So this was something that he has deeply invested in uh, for the most recent past lives, um, is this Leo, this sense of the ruler, the leader. Um, this can be very narcissistic, can be very egocentric, can have this incredible pride, right? Um, and a need and a desire to be seen as someone who should be respected, as someone who deserves to have power and authority and will use it properly, right? So on a soul level, Putin is very much aligned with this role. He's actually playing out his past life signature. This is likely not the first time that he has been in these kind of spheres of power and influence. This is a soul who has been working through proper use of power uh, for many lifetimes. Uh, but what we can expect is that he hasn't gotten this quite right, uh, as we'll see as the chart unfolds and what that might indicate. Um, he's still dealing with it. Now, we always look to the polarity point of Pluto in terms of the medicine, if you will, the direction for the life, right? So what this soul needs to incorporate into this Pluto position is the opposite sign in house. It needs a fourth house Aquarius mindset in order to balance out, to harmonize the energy, which means it's really about getting in touch with his roots. Who is he as a person very privately versus this very public 10th house, right? It's if you think about it as the top of the pyramid, the 10th house is very much that or the, the branches at the tops of the tree. The fourth house is the inverted bottom of the pyramid. I always think about the Great Pyramid in Giza, right? We see the pyramid above ground, but there's almost an equal and opposite inverted triangle beneath it that is the support of that structure. Similar to a tree, we see the trunk and the branches growing out to the sky, but that root system is the true depth and source of the energy of that entity. Much so, that's what the chart is showing us. Uh, whenever we look at the axis, that's why the axes are so important, right? We have that fourth to the tenth, and we have the first to the seventh, right? Which means that anytime we have planets in the tenth or the fourth, as well as the first or the seventh. These are the cardinal points of the chart. Any planets appearing in any of these four houses are always going to be prominent. So to have this, um, this natal Pluto with the south node, and he's, we'll see his axis is in that fourth tenth. This is a very important um, dynamic within this birth chart. 
that's particularly uh, the tenth and the fourth. Right, we're going to be looking at this, and we we know that the north node is going to be in the fourth house, always opposite the south node, and we'll get to that in a second. So, um, very prominent Pluto um, with conjunct um, the south node. This is a this is a lifetime, and this is a soul that's really doubling down on this uh, issues of authority. He's going to be incredibly drawn to being in positions of power having a leadership role. He's obsessed with it. It's almost an unconscious desire because Pluto tends to be very unconscious. It's the unconscious desire of the soul, right? And it's very familiar. It's a place where he um, has spent a lot of time uh, in this life and in past lives. Now, we can get a better sense of the qualities that this soul is bringing into through this past life connection to this south node Pluto or and um, south node Leo 10th house by looking at the ruler of the south node. So the ruler of both this Pluto and the south node uh, is the sun because the sun rules the sign of Leo. So we would want to look at this sun placement to get a better sense of what is this? How is this soul um, trying to experience and exercise this? this Pluto and this um, this 10th house Leo signature. And what we get is the sun in Libra and the 12th house. So a Libra sun, someone is very obsessed with, this is a relationship energy. Libra is all about relationships, tends to uh, be associated with things like justice, fairness, harmony, balance, uh, equilibrium, aesthetics, right? It's ruled by Venus. It has that sense of the, uh, the intellectual, it's an air sign, right? The ideas and the ideals, it's, very, uh, it's a very um, mentally oriented sign, it's an air sign. Um, but we also have to consider it in the 12th house, right? This is a, a very hidden house, it's a secret house. It's the, traditionally been called the house of the undoing. Um, usually there's, a, there's either a spiritual orientation um, to a, a soul that has the sun in the 12th. There's a lot of hidden. This is, this is beneath the surface. It's that house that's below the first house, right? It's everything that's in the 12th house is hidden or below the surface. Um, and it's very interesting that we have someone who um, wanted to be a spy when he grew up was this obsessed with um, secrecy and espionage. And we'll see, you know, a Scorpio rising is the perfect uh, symbol for the spy. It's all about secrets, hidden agendas, the underground, the occult, like detective work, right? All Everything done in secrecy. So um, it's no surprise that that was something that he gravitated. He saw himself as this secret agent uh, and was groomed by the KGB. Uh, to be a counterintelligence agent. Now, uh, it's also interesting, as you learn in his biography, uh, he has a law degree. He went uh, to university to study law, which means he did have, I think, political ambitions from the start, knowing that, you know, that is the most um, secure route to a political position is to study law. He studied international law, as a matter of fact. And uh, Libra is the sign that rules law and lawyers, right? So. Not surprising that when we see this um, Libra sun in the 12th house. So understanding also um, secret power dynamics. And I find uh, with politicians in particular, there's a lot often a emphasis on either the 12th or the 8th house or both. And we're going to see later on he has his moon in the 8th house. So uh, and there's a lot more going on as we'll learn as we unpack this chart. But this is how a good way of starting to look at uh, a chart from the inside out or the outside in, as we're doing here from the soul perspective. Now, we can add another factor if we look at the ruler of this sun being in Libra, we can bring Venus into the picture. And here we see he has Venus in Scorpio in his first house. So this is adding a dimension to this power dynamic. Now, I want to sort of unpack an interesting way you can sort of create a story, a narrative of what could possibly be part of this soul's journey. I'm not saying this is exactly what happened, but this is the way we start to um, use these symbols to get the archetypal complex of what possibly could be um, this soul's evolutionary journey. Because 
what we're starting to bring in here is a, is a feeling of the feminine, right? Because we have Sun in Libra, even though it's a masculine sign, it's ruled by Venus. And here we have Venus and Scorpio on the rising sign. So one of the ways we might interpret this is perhaps, uh, and one thing I think it's interesting, whenever you have the nodal axis in the fourth and the 10th houses, it can often, not always, but often um, indicate uh, a gender switch between lifetimes. So we could, it could be possible that Putin's uh, most recent past life was a woman and that this could be a, a, a first lifetime in a while uh, in, a, in the gender of a man. And, you know, what we might see with this Libra energy, which is the ruler of partnerships and spouses, right? That in the 12th house, one of the things I thought was like, well, perhaps he was married to power. Maybe his connection to power was from behind the scenes, 12th house, right? Um, and this Venus Scorpio, where he was married to or related to someone who was powerful. And that was his access to power in a past life or one of his past lives may have been through, um, through a marriage connection, through Libra, through partnership. Uh, and this Venus uh, on, the, on the ascendant, really, in the first house, right? This is showing us, you know, this is a pretty um, alluring, dynamic, um, a lot of sexual power. Whenever you have Scorpio risings, have that sort of magnetic intensity. There's something you, you often are drawn to them. Uh, but not knowing why, there's some internal, deep, um, intense power that Scorpio risings tend to have. They tend to be very alluring and sexual and attractive, and they exude this sense of power. Um, having Venus there just magnifies that. There's something very alluring and powerful, uh, and, and a sense of the feminine, like of that sexual power. The water, right? It's a water sign. It's emotional. It's it's very um, yin essence. And, you know, as someone we've seen these images of Putin over the years as this very strapping, you know, we see him riding uh, topless on horseback and, and fishing, you know, with his shirt off and um, doing his judo moves, right? There's something very sexy and alluring about the man. And then someone who has really um, crafted his image to a great extent. He is known to be obsessed with how he appears in the media, on television, right? Uh, someone very attuned to the power of the image um, that's very much indicated by this um, Venus in Mercury on the first, Venus in um, Scorpio on the first house, right? Very intensely focused on his own self-image, the aesthetics. How does it look? How does it appeal? Manipulation of the image, right? Start to get a sense of this character now, and that's also connected to this entire sort of past life story as the ruler of the sun, sun ruler of this Pluto uh, south node configuration. So this is a way we start to look at the story, right? The archetypal um, patterning with which this soul is choosing to work and has been working for lifetimes. Right. This is not a new configuration. This is actually very comfortable. What this shows us, this set of symbols, is this soul is really comfortable expressing itself through these, um, these pieces, these archetypal symbols. And of course, this has a sort of closed loop because having this Venus in Scorpio, well, that's ruled by Pluto. Right. So within these three or four symbols, we can really get essentially what this soul is coming into in this lifetime. Now, this is the past. This is the unconscious patterning. In order for this soul to evolve, it really has to focus on fourth house Aquarius. And now we'll bring in the North Node and just sort of exemplify how that works, right? Because this is a sort of, of a direction. And because we have Pluto conjunct the south node. It's a doubling of this intensity. Like he's really doubled down on trying to break through and evolve as a soul because what he really needs to get to is not this very comfortable and easy and familiar sense of being in a position of power and being a respected, um, 
you know, famous person. His soul is trying to get to this place of evolving to a deeper sense of his own personal self, fourth house, his roots, his tradition. Who am I? Who am I? Not who do people think I am, not the public perception of myself, but my own sense of my own self. And in Aquarius, right, something much more uh, progressive, something uh, much more idealistic, something much more connected to, you know, who I am I within the fellowship of humanity. And that's also Aquarian ideals and ideas. Of course, Aquarius also has a, a much more rigid, fixed, um, sort of narrow-minded, it can be a very narrow-minded sign. But in general, we're seeing this is sort of the direction that this life uh, and this soul is desiring to evolve. Now, it's not going to be easy for, the, for Vladimir to, to articulate and express this because when you have South Node conjunct Pluto, that pull of the past is so strong. It's going to be almost irresistible to be attracted to the power. And if we look at his biography, it's clear that he is really doubling down, it would appear, uh, on this aspect. He's being drawn to Leo, 10th house, power, rulership, uh, the authoritarian, iron-fisted ruler. Uh, so, so now we're, we can see that this is playing out archetypally uh, in this person's life, in this soul's condition. Um, and if it doesn't, you know, incorporate this fourth house Aquarius north node, um, it's subject to fail in, in, in disastrous, um, destructive ways, because that's how Pluto tends to work. Um, cataclysmic disasters. And what we're going to find out um, as we look at this 22 degrees of Pluto, uh, what we'll see at the end is we talk about this Saturn-Mars conjunction. It's happening at 22 degrees of Aquarius, exactly opposite. So let's keep that in mind as we keep unpacking this chart. But we can add some more, um, some more qualities to this. If we want to know how could this soul uh, manifest this North Node Aquarius in the fourth house, well, Uranus is going to tell us a lot about how that could happen, right? So we would bring the Uranus into the equation, and we see it's up here in Cancer in the ninth house. So in order for uh, Putin to, uh, his soul to express and, and evolve in that direction, he needs to be able to be um, revolutionary and innovative in his thinking and in his worldview, ninth house, in issues related to cancer, to home, the homeland, security, protection, the maternal, right? This is, a, this is an interesting connection between these two symbols with the North Node in the fourth house, uh, cancer, the natural sign of the fourth house, and the ruler being in cancer. So a way of incorporating that, uh, but this is going to be difficult because it's in conjunct to that position. So there's something about his very unique take on um, the idea of home, homeland, the motherland, which which what you would call Russia. He's very invested in that sense of tradition. Um, and what you learn about him is that he wants to bring Russia back to not just the days of the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, you know, they're they're saying that he really wants to be the czar, like the days of Peter the Great. He wants to be thought of and seen as one of the great Russian leaders of all time on the level of the Tsar. Not surprising, right, <laughs> with this configuration. Pluto, South Node, Leo, 10th house, the Tsar. This is a configuration for a Tsar-like character. But he's not perhaps able to incorporate this unique take on, uh, or maybe he is, maybe it is about in a way, his soul trying to get back to fourth house, the roots and the traditions of what Russia really was, which was an empire, a respected empire around the world. Um, and so it's interesting to sort of unpack that and see those dynamics playing out. Um, now, when we will do the same thing, we should also include the ruler of this Uranus uh, in Cancer, so that brings the moon into the picture. And we see he has a moon in Gemini in the eighth house. Um, so 
this is the other way that he really needs to get in touch with this north node fourth house Aquarius energy is by uh, being emotionally and intellectually attached to new ideas uh, communication dialogue interchange with other uh, people other cultures uh, in a deep and meaningful way a transformative way moon in the eighth house is very intense it's, it's they need to feel uh, intense connections with others and again i said you know 12th and 8th house tends to show up a lot in um, in the lives and careers of politicians it says a lot of that sort of political maneuvering backroom secretive uh, type of machinations that a lot of these characters have it's just that world that they're in uh, eighth house is like i said also the house of uh, the secrets of detectives of spies right you couldn't get someone uh, more attuned to being uh, a double agent or a counterintelligence agent than moon gemini eighth house information right always looking for information gemini that's secret that's underhanded that's hidden right manipulation right this is a very interesting configuration coupled with this um this scorpio ascendant and i'll just bring that in here uh and this uh, appeal this venus in scorpio on the first house despite they're in conjunction which is interesting and we're going to see there's a there's a yod here in his chart with his moon. So there's something very um, uncomfortable um, connection between this desire, this need to have information of the secretive or occult nature even uh, that is not quite jiving with his rising, this Scorpio rising, uh, even though there's a sort of mutuality in terms of the rising being Scorpio and that moon being in the house of scorpio that eighth house um, but this set of symbols now really gets us into the evolutionary um, trajectory of this soul past and future north node south node south node north node right and so this is the sort of underlying um, diagram within the blueprint of the soul but it's really helpful to take this approach because we see now these are the pieces that are going to be prominent. And the decision, you know, uh, are we going to stick with what's tried and true? The um, unconditional, unconscious urges of the soul for security, which says I'm going to need to be a much more important, powerful leader in order to be safe. Or can he evolve and say, no, I can be my own man. I don't need the limelight. The, 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 the work of this life is to find my true self. My true north is actually within me, my, my tradition, and getting in touch with this deeper emotional, uh, quasi-feminine energy, too. There's something about, you know, the eighth house, moon and eighth house tends to incorporate more of the, the, the feminine with that water energy, despite this being a very airy masculine sign. Uh, in Gemini, but a little ambiguity, right? That we could expect this character to be duplicitous and two-faced and talk out of both sides of the mouth. Um, and again, this is really setting us up for this character who's, I, I think, a very savvy negotiator, right? He knows how to manipulate people. Having that sun in Libra, right? Good at dialogue, interaction. It's the... the um, the perfect symbol for the diplomat. Very good at exchanging and, and making people feel like they're getting um, a fair shake, that they can be trusted. Uh, but something very duplicitous, possibly, with this moon in Gemini in the eighth house. Secret, underhanded, manipulative. Also with this Scorpio rising. Now we can start to bring in some more of these symbols now. We would fill out the rest of the chart from here, knowing that this is sort of the core uh, underbelly of the configuration. I haven't talked much about the aspects, but there's much more to be learned from them as well, right? We've got Sun uh, in a square with um, Uranus here, so that's a challenge to try to integrate this rebellious or um, revolutionary type energy, that sort of inner genius, and he has this very big philosophical worldview. 
He has a unique take on the world. And I think it reflects his desire to see Russia rise to greatness once again, to be the great world power, the motherland, the homeland, right? And that is fueling his, his drive, his identity. He identifies with bringing it back into balance. I think he sees uh, the, the post-Cold War as being a great imbalance in favor of the West and that the East really suffered in the Cold War and in the globalization that took place in that 20 years thereafter. And he's trying to restore that balance. And I think he identifies with that in a very uh, powerful way. And we can bring in his Mercury, which is also in Libra, right? So not only does he identify with it, he communicates in this way. And again, this is a this is a guy who um, studied law um, at university. So this is a very um, tight configuration for someone who would be a, pursue a career in law or politics, right? Libra, Mercury, Sun, right? Those um, symbols are very supportive of that type of career trajectory. Um, if we bring Neptune into the picture, we see he has Neptune conjunct that Mercury too. So here's someone who has a rather dreamy and idealistic vision of what that, that perfect balance or harmony could be, of what is right, what is just. Um, uh, could be delusional at the same time, right? And we talk a lot about this sense of him becoming unhinged, right? And sometimes his language could probably become very grandiose, um, seeing himself and his place in history as being um, almost godlike, as being transformative, as being transcendental, right? There's almost a mystical quality to this uh, configuration. It's often the case with people with a lot of 12th house energy. They can either be, be sort of the, the natural mystic, the transcendental, the spiritual, or it can manifest as this secretive, um, behind closed doors kind of manipulative kind of energy. And, you know, I don't know Putin. I don't know what his spiritual uh, insights are, but he has that capacity. Whether he's using them uh, for good or for ill, uh, that's for his own soul to judge. And I guess we can be the judge of that. But uh, we can see something very interesting taking place here. Um, you know, this whole stellium in Libra is in this sort of harmonious relationship to the nodal axis here. So um, it's bringing it, it's just reinforcing that story, which is why it's interesting to always start with that Pluto um, axis, if you will, the Pluto configuration. And we can see how this Libra energy, this 12th house Libra, has the capacity to access either of those poles. So again, is he gonna use this skill at being a skillful uh, diplomat, knowing what people want, how to appear, how to use his aesthetics and sense of um, really good information and ideas and his intellect to support his career, his fame, his reputation, his power, this Libra or this Leo? Or is he going to use it to enhance this transpersonal, trans, uh, transformational energy within his own self and identity and really bring home this North Node fourth house? I think we can say uh, with some certainty that it seems to be gravitating more towards this this polarity point, or this uh, Pluto point, right? This seems to be the axis and the anchor of this soul's chart. Everything is pointing to it in terms of the trajectory of his career. Now, um, we haven't looked at three other planets, and we should bring those in, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Of course, Mars, always important to consider. Um, with someone who has this sort of capacity for leadership and rulership, right? You see his Mars is in Sag in the second house, uh, trying the North Node in Pluto, right? So reinforcing this desire to be in a leadership position, to have this fame and reputation. Um, he has this capacity to, um, to move uh, on a sort of global scale. We think of Sagittarius being the most global and expansive of all of the signs of the zodiac. So Mars and Sag is, is a person who has energy to affect 
the world stage. They are, they are connected to the bigger picture of it all. And it's in his second house of resources. So I think it's interesting with a leader who has inherited the resources of a very vast um, and resource rich country. If we think about just the oil and natural gas uh, and that Russia actually during the Pluto in Sag period, but from like, you know, 94 to 2008, they really did shift the economy and become uh, really integrated into the global economy through their energy resources. I mean, much of Europe depends on uh, Russia for oil and gas at this point. So it's a very interesting uh, insight uh, that he's able to sort of leverage that energy, literally, the energy of Mars to uh, uh, use his natural resources, second house, money, wealth, power, um, to influence his own position of power, right? And this is someone who, you know, he uh, is rubbing elbows with his friends who are now all wealthy oligarchs. This is very much Russia has become a plutocracy under uh, Putin's guided hand. Again, Pluto, 10th house, Leo. It's, it's, it's almost uncanny when you start to look at this symbolism and how it plays out. So he's able to use that energy. Uh, it's also in a nice harmonious aspect with um, this uh, Mercury-Neptune uh, conjunction over here in Libra, right? You're getting this uh, fire and air sort of energy. A lot of fire and air in this chart. Um, he's full of vision. There's something very uh, uplifting about him. It also has that Scorpio intensity uh, manifesting as well. So... Um, interesting uh, factor to bring in. And then we'll bring in Jupiter, which is a really, um, it seems to be very important when we take, again, this um, evolutionary uh, approach. So Jupiter in Taurus in the seventh house. So this is his capacity uh, for expansion, for um, wealth, prosperity, wherever Jupiter is in your chart tends to be an area of life where you uh, have a lot of opportunity, a lot of generosity, a lot of um, abundance, right? It's the planet of abundance. So Jupiter and Taurus, right? Earth, right? Resources, it's the natural ruler of the second house. And the seventh house, so relationships of abundance around resources, natural or otherwise, money, wealth, finance, someone who has really empowered himself and his cronies uh, with the vast resources and wealth of uh, the country of Russia. So, And this is something that ties into this past life story because whenever you see a planet that is squared to the nodal axis, this is what we call a skipped step in evolutionary astrology. So this is probably the source also of his undoing in many ways. This um, grand desire to possess vast amounts of wealth and resources within his relationships. He's used these seventh house relationships, close personal friends, confidants, partners, whatever, um, to expand um, his, his power right also could be used in this life to transition into a more um, personal and transformative energy if he could use that north no but it, it it's telling us it's probably more going on um, up here uh, relating to this as we're seeing this is emerging as this is the this is the sort of focal point of this chart in more ways than one so this skip step, though, could be his undoing, the power, the expansion, right? Going, to, you know, what you can get with Jupiter is overindulgence, right? It can be too, sort of a greed can uh, manifest with this, especially in Taurus. Jupiter and Taurus can get very greedy, very possessive. Um, and this, and we're going to see, is going to play out in the transit that we're all, this is all leading up to. Um, very interesting. Um, so could be the undoing here too, that, that 
and what it was what I think if we look at one of the underlying factors of this invasion into Ukraine, yes, there's a historical precedent that it was part of the Soviet Union. Yes, it is territorially and strategically important in terms of its position on the on the Black Sea and having port access, being uh, the border with the West and all the NATO allied countries. But it is also a vastly rich country in terms of its natural resources. Lots of rare and precious metals, um, a lot of them that are used in the computer and microcomputer industry, microprocessors and all of that. Uh, so I think that that uh, is an interesting symbol here um, and could be part of the motivation for this invasion and could go either way. And I think it could play into, uh, if we consider that this has been his undoing in the past, uh, maybe his undoing uh, in this present life as well, because it seems to be pushing him back towards this this grasp of power. Um, and I think if we look at this evolutionarily, this is he may be, you know, thrown back on himself for not integrating these symbols in a more uh, evolutionary way. Last thing we'll bring in here. Uh, the last couple symbols. We got Saturn. Of course, now when we bring Saturn in, we see it is also conjunct this Neptune and this Mercury and the Sun as well. And it just brings now, you know, what we tend to see here is like this is the deeper soul level. And this is the sort of materialistic um, individual level of the self. This is someone who's so deeply invested in this archetype this um, 12th house Libra energy. And this is very interesting, you know, Saturn and, um, and, and Neptune are very um, uh, in complementary energies, right? Saturn is about limits and restrictions and borders and confinement authority. And then Neptune is, is sort of the borderless and the boundless, it's uncontainable. It's the oceanic oneness. So there's something very conflicted in this soul in terms of trying to integrate and balance and harmonize, right, Libra, some of this very divergent energy. At once he wants to control and restrict and be very limiting and exercise a sort of iron fist. And then there's also this part of him that wants to be grand and expansive and has this big um, unifying vision for what his impact is, is going to be, all connected to this very sort of authoritarian, um, apex predator, king of the jungle type of leadership um, quality that his soul is is working through. Um, and, you know, they're, they're somewhat connected. There's a sort of harmony between the two of them. They're in sex style. It's fire and air, right? It's, it's, it's the passion uh, combined with the will and the mental um, fortitude. This is a, someone who has a very, the, the mind of a, a steel trap, and you don't know what he's thinking, right? 12th house, all of this is under the hood, behind the curtain, very secretive. Only people within his very immediate sphere of trust get to see this side of Putin. We don't see, this is why he's such a mysterious figure, uh, because we don't see any of this. All of this is hidden. Right? His true identity is a secret. Only he reveals unto himself. He's in a relationship with himself. Libra, 12th house. Relationship to the self. Um, very difficult personality to get a, a grasp on, which is why he's such a mystery. But, you know, the chart doesn't lie. The chart tells us um, what's really going on. Um, last symbol we'll bring in here is just Chiron. We see he has Chiron in the third house in Capricorn. There's something, this is sort of the thorn in his side, right? That maybe uh, he has difficulty communicating and expressing himself, right? Despite this Gemini moon and it's in conjunct. What we hear, see here is what's called a, a yod or a finger of God with the moon because that moon is in conjunct to his ascendant and this Chiron. So it's very difficult for him to integrate this energy means he's very uncomfortable with himself because he's not able to integrate this image he's created for himself, this sexy, scorpionic, 
uh, Venusian ruled personality. It's not really reflecting his true, uh, the, his moon, his own emotional and interior mental landscape. There's something that doesn't jive with who he really is. And again, eighth house, secret. He keeps his true emotions and his true feeling nature to himself um, and often will present one side or the other, pretend to be something he's not, Gemini, duplicative. Um, and again, with that potential for a gender switch between lifetimes, I think there's something deeply conflicted about his, a lot of this bravado and this machismo that he is displaying, you know, I think is hiding a much more delicate, uh, feminine-oriented personality that he's trying to um, perhaps mask uh, with all of that machismo. Uh, and that's something connected to this wounding of uh, the paternal, the father image, right? For someone who has all this 10th house energy to have Chiron in Capricorn tells us that there's been a wounding that he's trying to maybe overcompensate for the lack of... Uh, a sense of his own authority, perhaps a relationship with the father. It's going to be a very difficult or broken relationship with fathers or father figures uh, and having to maybe overcome that and become his own father, his own sense of his, his, his ruler, his leadership uh, through this 10th house Pluto, something he's probably very comfortable with. And maybe that's a pattern that he's also trying to break free of or is repeating in this lifetime. So this brings up essentially the chart uh, of Vladimir Putin. And I think it's helpful to see it sort of build up in those kind of layers. That's the way I like to use this approach where we just add the planets and sort of follow the clues, if you will, to see what is really the most important and salient features. And, and it, it becomes clear here, right? We, we know we're dealing with this 10th house, this 12th house, this axis. Um, but what I wanna do now is show you guys his transits. So if we go to the chart right now, um, and I, I'm actually going to move forward to um, it's March 31st when I'm recording this, but uh, in a few days on April 4th, what I want to show you is we're having this Mars Saturn conjunction, and it is in exact opposition to his natal Pluto. Right. So if we talk about the evolution of this soul, right, this identity with being Pluto, Leo, 10th house, authority, leadership, right, the king, the, the czar, right, well, the energy is opposing that sense and tr trying to bring him down, literally down into the core of his chart from this very public place and saying, no, you need to. Um, integrate these energies. This feels like a challenge to his authority. And what did we talk about when we looked at this Mars-Saturn configuration, right? Fear-driven action, frustrated energies, inflaming old problems, boundary collisions, vindictive rage, right? So having this Mars-Saturn energy, testing his metal, right? I love that other one, right? Testing one's metal confronting challenges, this tension. He's kind of put himself in a very precarious position. He's kind of been backed into a corner. He's committed to this uh, invasion of the Ukraine. He's kind of pushed all his political capital uh, onto the table, and he's kind of all in on this maneuver. Um, it feels like this is really going to be um, a, his date with destiny. Like it feels very significant to have this Pluto-Saturn um, opposition to the exact degree um, of his natal Pluto, right? So this is, uh, and the other thing that comes into this, we will see that it's also uh, squaring his natal um, Jupiter, which we talked about, right? That this is the, the thing that perhaps um, was his undoing in a past life uh, is he? Is it going to be his undoing again? Is this difficult challenge and limits, limits to power is one of the ways we could look at this Mars-Saturn conjunction. Mars being power, Saturn being limits, right? And a limit to this expansive um, 
energy uh, within his natal chart that has fueled his ambitions, his ambitions for global uh, domination um, and resources of land itself. He's, a, he's trying to acquire a massive piece of land in the Ukraine. Taurus rules land, rules the earth as a resource, rules real estate, right? He's really trying to take a big piece of real estate by force. Uh, and so this will be interesting whether this plays out um, in terms of its, I think it's, but it's, it's an opposition to this natal Pluto is really the key to understanding this chart. So um, yeah, stay tuned. It would seem that this next week is going to be a really telling week for, for, for Vladimir Putin as a leader. Um, Time will tell, and, and what we've saw, you know, the reason I sort of wanted to look at this was like, it was very clear that that Pluto-Mars conjunction uh, was really um, in play in terms of the the decision to go to war. To, that was a, it was a good time to be aggressive. If you were using uh, astrology uh, in that archetypal way, right? That's, a, that's an aggressive energy. Now it's coming into a much more fear-based limits, restrictions, the sense of being um, cornered in a way, uh, and you could react violently or suddenly, right? That's, it's, you're coming up against hard borders with Saturn, limits, limits to power, right? This opposition with his natal Pluto and his south node. Um, this plays out as this sort of the meeting of, of fate, a date with destiny, um, or an encounter with fate. It has a fatalistic quality. Um, and it's, I always feel like whenever we're being pulled to our south node to the past, uh, we're, we're, we're messing with fate. Uh, and it feels like when we can embrace the north node and understand the desire and the need to evolve, that to me uh, relates to our destiny. And I feel like there's a fate versus destiny dynamic at play with this nodal axis. And it's playing out to a T in Vladimir Putin's chart. So as I said, time will tell. It'll be interesting to see what, what unfolds uh, on April 4th. Maybe we'll do a post game on that and to see if anything significant happened. Um, it may go by unnoticed, uh, but there'd be something I, I guarantee you deep in the soul of that man uh, it will be a, a moment of crisis um, and really confronting the challenges and the realities of the life that he has created for himself, the impact that he is having uh, on his fellow uh, citizens, on all Russians, on the Ukrainians, uh, and on the entire world, right? This is a, a lifetime uh, of, of uh, sort of magnanimous proportions. Uh, he, is, he is having a major impact, uh, but on a soul level, um, we shall see. All right, I hope that was helpful or inspiring or introspective, uh, give you a, a way of using astrology uh, as I love to do in terms of making sense of the world, understanding events, understanding people, their dynamics, their motivations, right? Putin is just, he's a human being. He's another soul who's just trying to evolve and um, maybe doing the best he can uh, or maybe just playing out uh, what is sort of fated for him in this lifetime. But uh, it's been my pleasure sharing that with you. Uh, if you liked uh, this content, please hit that like button. Uh, if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. We'd love to have you uh, as a subscriber. Uh, I hope you do more videos like this. Um, I love doing uh, these sort of uh, astro biography, if you will. So uh, if you'd like to see more of those, put that in the comments as well. Who, who else would we should we be doing um, these charts for and see whose blueprint, uh, what they have to say about them. All right, until next time. Satnam, everyone. Thank you.